track. Thanks for being here nice and promptly. We're going to get started with our first talk in this session. And I'd like to introduce Kylie Mathers. And Kylie, as Kylie's coming up to the front, I'll give you a little bit of information about her. So Kylie has worked in a, as a Queensland high school teacher of business and technology for 29 years. And this morning she's going to talk to us about, I guess, a little of a bit mm. about the, um, the traps and, and then the, it's a bit of a cautionary tale around <laughs> using drones in the classroom. And she's uh, appropriately titled her talk, Flying by the Seat of Our Pants. So I'm going to hand over to Kylie. And um, one other thing, just a bit of admin. If you do have any concerns or questions throughout the conference, those of us wearing the green lanyards are the people to approach. So just see someone with a green lanyard, come and have a chat, and we'll sort out any issues that you have. So, so that's, the, that's the thing to be looking out for. All right, Kylie, it's over to you. Yep, thanks, Bruce. And um, when I first came up with the idea that it might be a little bit fun to fly to Sydney and talk, I thought, oh, look, I'm a newbie, they don't know me. They'll chuck me at the end of the day. You know, when everybody's reading their emails and there's one or two people, didn't I get it wrong? <laughs> So, um, yeah, there won't be a whole lot of coding talk here. There won't be any flying of drones here today. So if you've come expecting to see things in the air, you're not going to. Um, it actually has a meaning, this flying by the city of plants. It means doing things by instinct or feel. And most of us do that every day as a teacher, especially when you're teaching code, because it's a different thing every year. The things that you used to teach the grade 12s, you're now teaching the grade 7s. <laughs> You know, and when you think about it, um, we come from a, a Catholic school that it's, last year we celebrated um, 50 years of being a Catholic school, which is pretty old up in Queensland. And we were one of the first, or well, we were the first Queensland co-ed school um, in the Catholic sector. So you could think to yourself, well, what on earth could make us think about playing around with sharp things? You know, and who has experience with that? Oh, I'm shining. Maybe high mech teachers, knives, 15 year olds, maybe. Maybe man arts teachers, yeah, yeah, they're pretty good with chisels and kids and trying to control them from slitting other kids. But um, maybe not risk adverse technology teachers like me. So it was a bit of a journey. A few years ago, Houston, we had a problem. We found that we were expecting too much of our students. We had uh, PHP um, for server-side um, interactions. We had SQL databases. And then we moved on to Arduino so they could do some prototyping. And then we threw JavaScript at them as well. And then Python came along. Oh, that too. So this is all within the space of a couple of years. So because of that, we couldn't really go very deep into any of the learning. And we kept starting a new language, starting a new language, and we didn't get very far into it. And we thought, oh, gee, wouldn't it be good if we could have one language all the way through? A little bit of a challenge, because at the time, that one language just didn't do it. And wouldn't it be really good if it was open source? So our priority was always try and be open source because, you know, anything could happen in a school. We might change from Apple to Windows. We might go to BYOD, which is all exciting. We might um, have our students leave our school and we really wanted them to be able to take the knowledge with them. So it wouldn't be great if we could do it all with Python. So we had some grand ideas. So at the beginning of last year, the search began. And we looked around and we looked around and we thought, well, whatever it is that we choose, it's got to be able to use um, and be applied with prototyping. Because there's nothing like when the students actually get that connection right, the light lights up or a sensor reads some movement in the room or a servo starts moving, a little light bulb switches on in the kids' heads and they get very excited. So it had to be applied to that. We had to be able to use the EV3s if we could. We had them in the cupboard. And, the, you know, at one stage I was thinking, oh, I might have to give them to a primary school because all you could use them for was with block coding at the time. So, and the, and the students were really engaged whenever we got them out of the box. And, of course, the poster boys in the moment, they were gaining popularity, the old drones. 
We had a bunch in the cupboard, again, block coding. So wouldn't it be good if the one program, one open source, could do all of those things? So at the, I think it was 2017 towards the end, um, there was a World of Drones Congress in Brisbane. The lady um, to the left is Dr. What's her name? Catherine Bell, I think. Thank you, Catherine Ball. And um, just like any old good woman, if she can't find something that she needs, she creates it. So she looked around for something that would bring together things such as developers, um, applications, commercial, researchers, all together in one, one place. Couldn't find it, so she um, created it. It's in its third year this year. So she was really good with um, setting up all of the industry there. Very interesting. They even had um, an army representative about all their little drones. And some, you know, even the little commando drones, they strapped to their belt. They're like little helicopters. Throw them over the wall before they send the commandos to see what's happening before the guys get killed. It's always a good thing. Um, and at the drone congress, the Queensland government announced their drone strategy. So this piqued our interest a little bit more to know that a government was going to see, uh, look at research and development, commercial um, investment, and create things such as drone pathways for commercial applications. And I thought, oh, well, this might be something we can play with. We took ourselves off to a couple of PDs. Um, you know, we call it work. Other people who saw our photos probably didn't. The drone on the left was about a $15,000 one and it felt like you were going to be chopped up immediately if you went anywhere near it. It was a big sucker. MJ Ratz is the guy on the side. He's a teacher up our way and he's a, he's a really good share of information. So on those days he let us know how he managed not to get any of the kids uh, chopped up uh, during their first year of operation. Cool, thank you. And, but they were just using Blockly code just to get their juniors started. In the cupboard, we still had our drones. Oh, radio, let's see what we can do. Have a look what's out there. So we had a little look out there. Tinker is what the other schools were using to run their drones. So Tinker's a drag and drop. And if we were going to meet the Australian curriculum, there's no way in a high school you could get away with that. Unless you were doing something like STEM where you could get them going very quickly, but you wouldn't meet the criteria you need. So we thought, oh well, had a go at that, that was cool, but let's move on. It's very babyish. Great for primary school, by the way. Um, Apple had a Swift and Playgrounds um, development area where you could link up to the, uh, the Mambo drones, but again, what happens if we no longer had Apple Max? Like, we're in it for the long term, not in just for this year. So it was something to think about, but we'd need iPads for this one. We didn't have iPads as another investment. Okay, and then um, there's these nasty looking suckers called co-drones. They do Blockly or they do an Arduino type coding. Again, it would mean buying another bunch of drones. And I've already got a couple in the cupboard. You know, I've, I've got plenty of students willing to take them off my hands, but I'd rather not spend another, you know, 10,000 or so to get started. Luckily for us, the year that we started looking, um, Dr. Amy was also multitasking and getting something done, and she created the Pi Parrot Library. So the Pi Parrot Library at the beginning of last year wasn't terribly well documented in all of the um, platforms, so the Mac wasn't so terribly well done. It had a little bit, but it was very much well documented in the other bits, and it has since um, gained momentum. Um, Amy, on the other hand, over there, she looks really young, doesn't she? Young and gorgeous for a doctor. I think that's the difference between teaching students and teaching lecturing, do you think? I don't know. Um, at the same time she was doing the Pi Parrot Library, she was working with um, AI and machine learning of severe tornadoes, hail, storm predicting, all at the same time. So I call that a little bit of overachieving. Don't know what you call that. Um, and it looked like from the Pi Parrot Library when we read the docs that if we bought these little Lego attachments on the top, plug them in on top of our little drone, it would allow our Apple Macs, you don't need it if you're running Raspberry Pi or anything else, 
to talk to our drones. So we're, oh, we can use the suckers in the cupboard just by these little attachments, we might be able to get going. So the only problem with that is that you had to go through all of the technical stuff because you know, I never came through with that sort of technical stuff when I went through uni. So one of our number um, has the technical ability, thank you Daniel, and he took a little bit of time to see if it was possible for the Macs because the documentation wasn't full, but it meant working with Terminal. I don't know about you, but Terminal for me, with Max, brings back memories of this. You know that smug little arrow, it just sits there looking at you and only those in the know can get anything to happen. And even if it gets to happen, it never tells you it's happening, it's a secret. Like it doesn't give you feedback, it doesn't say type, the, it, it's not a nice thing. So, you know, that brought flashbacks of swapping in the five and a quarter inch floppy and waiting three minutes, swapping in the other one. And suddenly you've got this little green arrow and you're going, oh, that was great. I think I've achieved something, wouldn't know. Anyway, it looked like we could do something. It looked like Pi Parrot was a thing for us. Let's give it a go, experimental. And this is where the flying by a seat of our pants, we needed some test bunnies for this one. Well, I think we found them in our grade 10 kids. It was term four, what could go wrong? They were keen, maybe a little bit too keen. You know, oh, it'll be right, miss, it'll be right. We could race them. Yeah, that's where my heart level went up and down a little bit going, oh, I don't know. I don't know about the racing business. So I'm thinking, well, how are we going to approach this? Sketched out, as you do, really quickly, an idea of what you think might be the approach. And you might look at it again at the end and go, oh, I'm not going that way again. So in order to slow them down a little bit, I thought I'd start with like, what is a drone? That sort of thing. And then bore them a little bit more with safety and legislation. <laughs> Just calm it down for a few weeks before we get into the chopping people up business. <laughs> okay. So we started with getting to know the drone. So in German, we found out it means draw. Yeah, that's really funny, guys. And then Swedish, it means to draw. So the kid's going, oh, that's hilarious, yeah. But today, you know, it could mean anything from sound to a, a male bee. And the kid's going, oh, it does sound like a bee. Yeah, 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 whatever. So um, still in the, in the way of trying to calm them down, types of drones. Hey, guys, do you realise they're not just flying things? We've got drones on the Great Barrier Reef sticking it into the Crown of Thorns starfish. We've got those little stupid things. We've got bots, plenty of bots. And then we've got the flying things. And they go, oh, yeah, the flying things. We like those. Like, Let's get into it. No, no, you're going to have to do some research first and calm down. So I made them pick one of these topics. These are all these like applications of drones that are out there, you beaut, fantastic. And each of them had to pick one and then report back to the class and talk to us. You know the old talking business? They didn't want to do that at the beginning, but it was just an informal talky thing. Because in our assessment in our senior, you've got to talk. Um, and they had to tell us whether it was, uh, you know, is it a real thing? Is it a marketing ploy? Um, and what do you think? Is there any issues that you can see there? So they were quite interesting, some of the things they came back with. The Lady Gaga and the Intel drones, for example, and the Winter Olympics were hilarious. So we came up with a whole bunch of lists. So were there any problems with drones? Oh, yeah. So they became those critical thinkers. Yes, it's annoying. Oh, there's a few privacy issues. Large numbers of drones, if you live on the Gold Coast, don't know about you. Every man and his dog wants to film themselves surfing. Um, and you're under, a, you know, an airport place too, so you can't really fly them, but they do anyway. Larger drones can handle the, the larger weights, but that's a bit of an issue as well. And then we spoke about, well, who is responsible when those suckers crash on your head? And a little bit of safety. So I'm trying to impress on them that they're not all fun and games. Safety equipment. Mother and me couldn't let that one go past. So I, you know, got onto eBay and such and bought a couple of these. They're expensive. I don't know where they... I can see why people steal them now from the council worker. <laughs> They're about $120 each. So they were used in order to uh, rope off the areas so that we could allocate where the pilot would stand and where everybody else wouldn't. They got confused about those two issues every now and again. We introduced the high-vis vest for the pilots. 
So that helped a little bit about working out who should be flying this drone or who's coding this drone at this moment. You could, should be able to see that person quite quickly. And then we found these things. My husband and I ran through this PowerPoint with him. He goes, oh, is that lipo? No, it's not lipo suction. No. You shut your yeah, battery in there to stop it from blowing up. So these minimise the tendency of batteries, which they do. They do tend to set fire to themselves every now and again. So when you charge, you don't leave them overnight. It's not good for the school, unless, unless you've left some expensive things there you'd like to be replaced. So with the lipo safe bag, I found that two bags worked really well. Yes, they're $35 each, but one for the spent batteries and one for your newbies all fully charged so that you could keep control. Because when you've got 15, 30 batteries, you, you tend to forget which is which. And of course, uh, safety goggles, the height of fashion for all those little soft eyeballs. And if you've ever had a drone in the same room as you with 15 year old boys, you know that your eyeballs suddenly become very precious. And we also had these little uh, safety signs that we put at the front of each doorway entering the zone just to stop people because they start looking at the drone or they start looking at the fun you're having or the yelling or the dark. They, they get distracted by that and they walk straight in. So if you've got this in the way, you're going, come on, mate, back out. Because you don't need some extra curiosity walking around your room. You've got too much fun going on in there already. Okay, so I'm going, right, we're getting close, guys. We're going to be flying soonish, not really. So let's start thinking about how serious this is. So I found a really good calculator, the SPLAT calculator. It's a good one. And I said, well, you know, how, how big is this drone? That we, the one that we fly outside is 1.4 kilos. And I said, so if that fell on someone's head from 30 metres, 30 metres isn't very high. I said, how much would it you know, weigh when it hits them? And I think I worked out it would hit them at 87 kilometres an hour. And I said, would that hurt? Oh, I think it would, miss. OK, good. Well, I said, well, well what about we go 50? We can go up to 120 metres here, the Gold Coast, where we are. I said, but let's just go 50. How much would that be if it hit somebody? And it turned out it was something like, you know, you're always going to be pulled up, maybe 118 kilometres an hour. So that, for us, is like being hit on, on the M1 by a car with knives on it. And the kids go, oh, oh, that would hurt. Yes, it would, guys. <laughs> so all of the flying business that happens on the Gold Coast around the beaches and stuff with people doing their, doing their um, surfing videos and such because they're so cool, that has potential to damage quite badly. So because I like to push home the point with the boys, uh, we did a bit of Fruit Ninja. Have you seen this one? I'll give you a few minutes. You've seen it? Yeah, I see a lot of nodding. It cuts up a lot of fruit. Would you like to see a few minutes? Yeah? Right, we'll see if we do. Just tell me when you get bored. So it starts with... Um, oh, do I have sound? Yeah. So it starts with grapes and you go, oh, that's all right, isn't it? They're just soft and the kids usually come up with this. And then it moves on later on to... Um, <laughs> To, to tomatoes, you go, oh, they're a bit like an eyeball. Oh, no, eyeballs are much, much more sturdy than, than uh, tomatoes. You go, oh, okay. So it goes through all the food. All the food groups are here, represented. And again, <laughs> and again, my husband, you know, he, he showed concern with this one. He said, well, who, who's going to clean up the drone? It's all right, darling. I don't, I don't think that's the idea of it. So yeah, he got a little bit concerned. And then the kids go, oh, well, that's not a finger. Human bodies are so much more harder than a piece of fruit. There's your eyeballs. Yeah. And then um, I think further on, it gets pretty exciting and it goes through. Oh yeah, it's doing a bit of a cucumber job there. Sausages. Oh, carrots, yeah. And I say, well, carrots are pretty hard. That looks like a finger to me. The kids go, oh, yeah, okay. Eyeball, I said, there's another eyeball going. So, you know, keep your glasses on, kids. It goes on like that. So it goes on and then, and then to my husband's delight, the thing takes off at the end, which is really exciting for him. Is it all right with everyone? If we, oh no, we'll, we'll watch the last 30 seconds. More sausages. There, yeah, that, oh, oh, husband was so happy. He said, oh, I didn't stop it from working, no. <sighs> Yeah, that's exciting. Oh, I thought I moved on in life. The video didn't. 
There we go. A pilot friend of mine, I'm going to stop that, sent me this one because um, he does time with cadets, Air Force cadets or Air Cadets, we call them. And he showed concern that, you know, these drones are really quite exciting, but, you know, um, he's a pilot for Qantas and he's a bit concerned about it. So he sent me this one and I think it's... To the wing. While Porman yeah, I think it's 140 so, I want it. Because the energy is, uh, goes up with the square of the velocity. This guy's really interesting, not. For nearly 30 years. One minute 40. Here. Sorry, I'm just going to go to there. The drone did not shatter apart. It completely penetrated and it was buried inside the wing. You can see a hole in the leading edge here. The so the difference between what a drone does when it impacts the wing of a small plane is it actually goes into it and starts killing all of the construction within the wing. So that's a problem for a pilot. Whereas a bird, uh, it's okay, they don't use a real one. Oh, sorry, I thought I was talking to the students who get upset with Gracie stuff. You obviously don't. Oh, come on, where are you? There. Can you see how that doesn't actually go into the wing? So that's the difference, is that they used like a silicon package to represent a, uh, a bird strike. And the bird tends to wrap itself around the wing. It doesn't go inside and continue wrecking it. So the plane can still land fine with a dent. So, you know, for him, it was a really big concern if, if, if I kept coming along and talking to him about drones and he's, oh, but did you realise? Yeah, I know, they're dangerous, mate. Anyway, so again, still on the safety bit, we go into the CASA website, we start looking at legislation. Oh, serious kids, serious, there's laws here, there's laws, yes. And of course, you know, drone foul videos. How are we going, Bruce? Have we got time for a drone, two minute drone foul video? Okay. What does that mean? How many minutes? Yeah, okay, that's good. Yeah, that's good. I like this music. It's as lovely, isn't it? Oh, do I get rid of that? About now, this guy's um, drone battery is going, automatically land, I'm dying, my battery's dying. And you can see the guy on the far side suddenly realises. says, no, I think I'm going to land now, into the water. And he says, no, $3,000 worth of toy. So he begins his Olympic run as it goes into emergency landing mode in the ocean. This is an absolute class. Can you see him? Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. Yes. And of course it's a guy. If it was a girl, they'd be like, oh, not doing that. But the guy said, oh, I'm a toy. There he goes. Put down your remote. There he goes. So this thing's still got the blades going. Full blades going. Fruit Ninja style. Watch the wave coming around his neck. Yes, yes, but I've got my drone. It's really important. Oh, I'm so happy I saved my drone. And I'm sure everybody else around him is going, what an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so it came close to the time when we're saying, well, there's legislation, there's stupidity, you're in the moment. Um, at the time there, there was the Can I Fly There app, which, you know, uh, encouraged the students before they took off to work out, is there anything else around? So you can see here in the blue position is where we are on that map, for instance, when we started up this app. And you can see that there's a fire uh, burning off of, you know, winter burn off happening in the left. And you can see all those circles, they're all heli helipad zones. So in that position, once it does, it says, look, you can't take off here. You're within a hospital helicopter area. If you are flying at the moment, please land. 
And see, most in the Gold Coast, we can't even have the drones with the, um, what's it called, the Little Nipper program or something like Little Ripper, patrolling the beach, because um, we're within the landing zone for the, for the airport. So we can't have that, and yet they're all up in the air. Then I, uh, I threw a com comprehension test at them. I made one up, but you know, obviously CASA thought it was really good because they've now got one in their drone flyer site. Mine was better, obviously. Um, and just to, to check that they knew what they were doing, because quite a lot of the time the kids are just not. And then it was really important that they knew about the principles of flight, or maybe the principles that I think flying involves, okay? Because there is a little bit of, you know, staying up their business. And then with the coding to come, I could see that they needed to know the movements a plane makes because some of that coding involves knowing what yaw is, what pitch is, what roll is. And of course, then we came down to safety. <laughs> so we needed to find a safe place to fly. So I'm looking around the school and it needed to be somewhere indoors because those little Mambo drones, they tend to blow away a little bit with the wind. And I thought, well, it's got to be inside, somewhere with a bit of a soft landing because damage is something I, I do. I'm challenged with damage. You know, a propeller here and a motor not fitting properly anymore there. I get, you know, I, I end up giving up. So it had to be that. It had to be somewhere that could be roped off a little bit but had enough of a high ceiling. Lucky for us, the library looked like a possibility and the librarian made the mistake of thinking that it might be fun. Yeah, so we booked in. So the first thing that needed to happen was that those students in grade 10 had to engage with the terminal. And that's okay because I was there on the journey with them about this scary little arrow. So they had to install, um, I think it was the Untangle, Zero Conf, according to the docs in PyParrot, clone their PyParrot from GitHub and install PyParrot. And, and obviously the latest version of Python and maybe an IDE. Now this is the first time that they interacted with an IDE because before that they were always grokking. So always within that safe environment. So this was a real challenge for them and they didn't like having to be so technical, some of them, and some of them loved it. So the first exercise we got them to do was, hello, anyone home? And it was about working out if there was a connection with the drone, from the computer to the drone. So in PyParrot, they had some sample code. I pseudocoded it first, flowcharted it first, explained it, then got them to copy and paste. And the idea was if they had installed those libraries properly, they would get a connection, success. And there was some excitement in the room. Then there were some very quiet kids. I found them later though, because when it came to this, it was time to take off and land they couldn't take off and land until they had installed those libraries and gotten that success. And they're going, oh, but I should just be able to copy John's and it's not working. Yes, yeah, because you didn't do what I told you to two lessons ago. So each time we pseudo-coded, then they worked on their previous code and added an extra bit of code or adjusted their previous code in order. So they, the ones who were listening, the ones who were following instructions had a high level of success. You can see with the pie parrot on the right, they had two different types of takeoff and landing instructions. We encouraged them to use the safe takeoff and safe landing. It's really good when you get those, I don't know, mavericks, I guess I call them, in the classroom. They, they, oh, testing is not a thing that they, they like to do. They just, that eternal loop. You know, up it goes and the drone will stay and it will never come down. So we, we earned to turn a loop. That one was good because all you do is flip the sucker over and it turns off in the safe mode. That was good. Then we did some CrossFit, I called it, iterations, up, down, up, down. So a looping. And then what they did is go into the function mode. So making a function of the up, making a function of the down. And that really made it real for them in the end because we'd done functions in Grok, but until they could actually see it doing what it asked it in the function, it made it huge for them. So this one is when it came through for them. We did some square dancing, which is a vertical square. Um, we did pitching, yawing, uh, flipping out, and going around a circle. That was pretty challenging. And then we had the assignment. So the assignment was a promotional video or a or a design for a disaster scene, easy to find in our classroom. 
and yeah, like that. Just like, yeah. this is one of the products that the kids who chose to do the promotional video, not the coding. So they had to work in groups, one coded, one did the promotion. And some of them tried to use the library bookcases for mountains. Uh, malfunctioning drone. I might just flip past there. So on reflection, the physical application of the drone was really motivating for the students. They could immediately see what was happening. Those around them could see what wasn't happening and they stepped in to help and give advice because it was obvious whereas it wasn't just on somebody's computer, it, they could see what it was. Unfortunately for me, it was this physical application that was really challenging for me. Managing the workflow of 20-something students, a couple of drones, you know, the movement around the room, the kids who needed help, the kids who were ready to fly, the batteries, that whole thing was really challenging. It was so highly visible that that peer tutoring was impressive. I reckon the safety considerations could be improved next year for me, but the engagement was really good. So I found them at my door of my office, ready to take all the gear each time. I'm like, oh, you guys are a bit weird, really? Are you ready to start? Like, the bell only just went. What are we doing? Oh, no, we're setting up. Great. Can't wait for that to finish. So what worked and what didn't? Working with only three drones at once was a plus. I found any more, the Bluetooth connections went a bit weird. Keeping a space ready to swap in, a uh, spare drone to swap in was a good thing. Um, Labelling each drone with their identifier number helped find it because some kids just wouldn't stop that connection. They took it away with them for the next half hour and wouldn't disconnect and you go, come on, who's got drone 114623? Come on, who's got it? You haven't let go. So the next kid could have a go. Um, the LiPo bag's fantastic. The high-vis, definitely. So you could get the invaders out of the flying. Get out. You're not a flyer. Get out. That sort of thing. Controlling the workflow was very difficult. Um, we have a mapping map. Uh, you just throw it out, and it's got a satellite picture of wherever you like. So we found that from She Maps, and it helps if you want to do some sort of mapping, grid work sort of exercises, or if you want them to find the shopping centre and, and drop off a package. Um, containing the flying would be good. That's one of the things I'd improve. I'd buy one of the little flying cages. And I found that the non-authentic batteries, the ones at the top, they, um, they were great. They were less than half the price, but, oh, but um, the Bluetooth connection wasn't as much. So I'm going to flip through. And boys do work differently to the girls, just so you know, completely differently. So that's our reflections. So any questions? Great. No, I like no questions. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Kylie, for sharing um, what you got up to and, and sharing those words of wisdom. Uh, a mug. Oh! And a couple of extra bits and pieces in there to, thank to thank you, you for that. Now